New York Harbor was once home to 220,000 acres of oyster reefs, so abundant they fed a city and shaped the shoreline. By 1927, relentless overharvest and waves of sewage left the water nearly lifeless. Its oysters gone, its past forgotten. But 10 years ago, skeptics scoffed as a handful of visionaries began dropping millions of baby oysters and restaurant shells into those polluted depths, banking on a comeback no one thought possible. Now, more than 120 million oysters thrive where almost none survived before. But if you think this is a simple redemption story, think again, because in They Dropped Millions of Oysters into NYC's harbor, 10 years later, the water fought back. What the water gave, it didn't give back easily. So, how did centuries of collapse set the stage for an unlikely gamble? Let's find out. Centuries before skyscrapers crowded the skyline, the waters around Manhattan teemed with life. Oyster reefs sprawled across more than 200,000 acres, an underwater world so vast that early Dutch ships steered wide for fear of running aground. For the Lenape people, these reefs were more than just a food source. Shells and meat shaped daily life woven into tools, trade, and the rhythms of each season. Archaeological middens on the islands and shoreline still reveal layers of oyster shell, stacked by generations who gathered from the beds each year. When European settlers arrived, oysters quickly became the city's signature dish. Street vendors sold them by the bucket, taverns served stews to dock workers and bankers alike, and piles of shell waste grew into new land along the waterfront. By the late 1800s, New York had earned a new nickname, the oyster capital of the world. Records from the timeless shipments of millions of oysters each week, bound for distant cities and local tables. Reefs stretched from the battery to the outer reaches of the harbor, shaping the very edge of the city and the lives of everyone who lived there. Oysters filtered the harbor's water, clearing sediment and feeding a web of fish, birds, and invertebrates. Their reefs broke waves and calmed storms, protecting the city's growing shoreline. For generations, these living structures made the harbor not just navigable, but abundant. An engine of commerce and a daily presence in New Yorkers' lives. Early laws even tried to protect the beds, with colonial bans on harvesting during spawning season as early as 1715. But the appetite for oysters only grew, matched by the city's hunger for expansion and profit. On any given day, the markets buzzed with trade. Barges loaded with shell and meat drifted upriver, while fishermen measured their catch by the ton. Oysters were currency, culture, and sustenance all at once. Even the city's architecture carried their mark. Shell mortar held together the walls of early buildings, and landfill made from discarded shells pushed the shoreline outward, shaping new neighborhoods from what the harbor provided. This golden age built on the backs of countless reefs was more than a chapter in the city's history. It was a way of life, inseparable from the tides and seasons. But abundance came with a cost, and the choices made during these years would ripple far beyond the last market stall or shucking house. The city's identity was forged in saltwater and shell, and for a time, it seemed as if the reefs would last forever. By the early 20th century, the city's hunger for oysters had pushed the reefs to their breaking point. Harvesters rake the beds flat, hauling out millions each week. But the real trouble came from above the waterline. As the city's population soared, so did the volume of untreated sewage pouring into the harbor. The same tides that once carried oyster larvae now delivered waves of waste and chemicals from factories and sewers. Combined sewer overflows, pipes that dumped stormwater and raw sewage straight into the estuary, became a daily fact of life. The water darkened, oxygen levels dropped, and disease swept through the beds. By 1927, the last commercial oyster grounds in New York Harbor were shut down. Health officials declared the shellfish unsafe to eat, and the city's most famous industry vanished almost overnight. The loss wasn't just culinary. Without reefs to filter the water, sediment and algae built up. Fish and birds lost their habitat, and the harbor's reputation shifted from an engine of abundance to an open sewer.
For decades, the water was considered nearly dead. City planners focused on growth, not recovery. The harbor's decline became a cautionary tale, proof that even the richest ecosystem could be undone by neglect and unchecked waste. But the tide began to turn in 1972 when Congress passed the Clean Water Act. This sweeping law forced cities across the country to confront the pollution pouring from their pipes. Overnight dumping untreated sewage became illegal. New York began the slow task of upgrading its aging infrastructure, building wastewater treatment plants and tracking sources of contamination. It was a massive, expensive undertaking, one that would take decades to show results. Yet for the first time in half a century, the harbor had a legal lifeline. Water quality started to improve little by little. Fish returned to parts of the estuary. Scientists found tiny signs of hope on old pilings and forgotten rocks, where a handful of wild oysters clung to survival. The reefs were gone, but the idea of restoration was no longer a fantasy. The law had cracked open the door, offering a second chance for a harbor written off as lost. In 2014, a handful of harbor school students stood on Governor's Island, surrounded by piles of empty oyster shells. Their assignment sounded simple, turn restaurant waste into the building blocks of a living reef. The project's founders, Pete Malinowski and Murray Fisher, saw potential where most saw only garbage and red tape. They called it the Billion Oyster Project. The goal was ambitious. Restore a billion oysters to New York Harbor, one recycled shell at a time. The process began with a network of city restaurants. Every week, volunteers and students collected buckets of discarded shells from kitchens across Manhattan and Brooklyn. Instead of heading to landfills, these shells were ferried to curing yards, open-air lots where they would dry for months, sunlight and rain scrubbing away lingering food and bacteria. By the end of the first year, the mountain of shells weighed over 100,000 pounds. That's the equivalent of about 45 compact cars stacked in a corner of the island. Turning shells into new reefs required more than muscle. Students learned to seed each shell with oyster larvae. Tiny drifting spat bred in tanks at the harbor school's hatchery. The spat settled in clusters, cementing themselves to the old shells. Each batch was carefully counted, tagged, and tracked, with students logging every step. Some days meant wading into frigid water to check cages, Others meant troubleshooting pumps and filters in the makeshift lab. The work was gritty and repetitive, but every shell seeded was a vote for the harbor's recovery. Regulations shaped almost every move. New Jersey had banned oyster restoration in polluted waters four years earlier, after a poaching scare. In New York, every reef needed a stack of permits. The rules were strict. No harvesting, no shortcuts, and constant monitoring to keep the project above suspicion. Students and staff installed underwater cameras and RFID tags on cages. They posted signs warning that the oysters weren't for eating. Even so, some officials dismissed the effort as a science fair stunt, not a real solution for a polluted city. But the project kept growing. Harbor school crews set up conveyor lines to haul shells from the curing yards to barges, then out to restoration sites around the harbor. Each new reef was a lesson in logistics, timing the tides, navigating boat traffic, and anchoring structures in unpredictable currents. The students became experts in problem solving, adapting when storms washed out gear or when a batch of spat failed to attach. Every setback brought a new workaround, and every successful deployment sparked a sense of pride. By the end of 2015, the Billion Oyster Project had seeded millions of oysters along piers, breakwaters, and forgotten corners of the city's shoreline. The work was far from glamorous, but it was relentless. For the first time in decades, New York's harbor was being rebuilt from the bottom up, by hand, by students, and by anyone willing to get their boots muddy. The reefs were still young, and skepticism was everywhere, but the foundation was set. The city's experiment and restoration had moved from idea to action, shell by shell. At Hudson River Park, the first real test of the city's oyster comeback took shape beneath the surface. 
scientists and volunteers on worked side by side, lowering clusters of reef balls and wire gabions seeded with millions of hatchery-raised spat. These structures, designed to mimic the nooks and crannies of natural reefs, quickly became magnets for marine life. Within the first three years, survey teams counted more than 35 million spat settled across the site. But numbers alone didn't tell the full story. Divers and students monitoring the reefs began to notice a growing cast of characters. Blue crabs, oyster toadfish, mud snails, and tiny shrimp all weaving through the shells. By year three, careful species counts revealed a clear difference. Gabion cages hosted 37 different species, while nearby reef balls supported 32. That's a boost in biodiversity that even the skeptics couldn't ignore. Up the river at Tappan Zee, another surprise was unfolding. Here, the project team had deployed bare substrate, clean shell and rock, without seeding it with hatchery spat just to see what would happen. The results stunned even the most cautious biologists. Over the next few seasons, wild oyster larvae found the new habitat on their own. By the time the team finished their counts, they tallied 5.8 million wild oysters settled naturally on the site. It was the first time in living memory that the river had produced a spontaneous oyster boom on a human-built reef. Marine scientists called it a turning point. For years, the assumption had been that New York's waters were too polluted, too unpredictable for wild recruitment. Now the evidence lay in the mud, millions of shellfish thriving without a single hand from the hatchery. Volunteer monitors played a crucial role in capturing these results. Armed with clipboards and waterproof cameras, they logged every creature spotted on, every shell counted, and every new patch of reef that took hold. Their data, checked and double-checked by marine biologists, built a growing case that the restoration was doing more than just adding oysters. It was jump-starting a whole web of life. The numbers kept climbing, more species, more spat, more evidence that the harbor could still support a living reef. Students who started out skeptical found themselves measuring fish and crabs that hadn't been seen in these waters for decades. For the first time, the city's experiment wasn't just surviving, it was thriving. And the proof was written in the numbers, the species lists, and the living reefs growing just below the waves. The city's doubters had new data to reckon with, and the harbor had a new story to tell. By 2024, the numbers tell a story no one can ignore. Across New York City's harbor, more than 130 million live oysters now anchor nearly 19 acres of restored reef, enough to cover about 14 football fields if you laid them end to end. The effort has pulled over 2 million pounds of discarded restaurant shells out of the city's waste stream, turning what once was trash into the foundation for new life underwater. Project coordinators track each load, each shell, and every batch of spat seeded in the hatchery. These reefs aren't just numbers on a spreadsheet. They're living structures, dense with oysters that filter water, provide shelter, and build the base for a growing marine community. In places where the harbor once seemed empty, clusters of oysters now stack along gabions and reef balls, their shells layered thick from years of steady work. Every acre reclaimed, every million oysters added, stands as proof that a handful of students, volunteers, and advocates can rewrite the fate of a city's waterfront, one shell at a time. Even as oyster numbers climb, the work is far from finished. Each new reef faces a gauntlet of natural and human-made threats. Disease remains a stubborn adversary. Pathogens like Dermo and MSX, common along the East Coast, can sweep through a population in a single summer, leaving empty shells where clusters once grew. Marine pathologists at local labs keep a close watch, testing for early signs of infection and adjusting broodstock sources to outpace the next outbreak. Meanwhile, design teams race to outsmart the elements. After dock failures and heat waves triggered mass die-offs in recent years, engineers have shifted to modular cages and deeper placements, hoping to buffer oysters from temperature swings and freshwater pulses. But even the healthiest reefs can't solve everything. Combined sewer overflows still pour untreated waste into the harbor after heavy rains, 
forcing health officials to keep strict no-harvest rules in place. No matter how many oysters are seeded, 100 million juveniles a year, or even a billion by 2035, these reefs can only complement, not replace, the city's $45 billion investment in wastewater upgrades. Still, there are bright spots. Wave attenuation from restored reefs is already helping to stabilize marsh edges and protect vulnerable shorelines. Each new acre brings the city closer to a future where oysters are more than a symbol. They're part of the harbor's defense. The mission continues, balancing hope with the hard lessons of biology and infrastructure. By 2024, over 130 million live oysters have been restored across 19 acres of New York City's harbor, an area equal to about 14 football fields. What began as a risky experiment, mocked and restricted by strict permits, now stands as measurable ecological progress. Oyster reefs are filtering billions of gallons of water, supporting over 35 native species, and buffering shorelines. Yet the waters remain closed to harvesting due to ongoing sewage overflows, and year-to-year -year survival can vary with heat and disease. Not all monitoring data has been published, and the long-term impact on water quality is still under review. The evidence shows oysters are not a cure-all, but the data confirms they help cities adapt and recover lost habitat. New York's story proves that even after near-total loss, persistent effort and science-backed action can rebuild what once seemed gone for good.